Welcome to Eye on Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative products, and the innovative people that run those companies and make those products. Tonight, we are very privileged to have with us Janae Dana and Adam Ron of Focus Opus. Welcome to the show, folks. Thanks, Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Well, let's start with, tell us the story about how Focus Opus came into being. You have a very interesting background. Yeah, well, I, it, Focus Opus didn't originally start out as a, as a business. Okay. I was attending UCLA, and I was really stressed out. And at uh, my sophomore year, I almost dropped out. Okay. I ended up getting diagnosed with ADHD. And then I decided to do two years of school in one because I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Okay. And uh, I thought it was going to be hell, but it didn't matter to me because I can see the light at the, uh, light at the end of the tunnel okay. uh, in nine months. And it ended up being the best year I ever had. And that made no sense to me because I was doing a double load of UCLA requirements and working lit, okay. yet I felt like I had more free time. And my social life was even better and my grades improved and they were already good. So that just didn't make sense, so I kind of reverse engineered what I had done okay. after graduating and uh, developed a planner system for myself. And it was originally called my focus book. At the time, okay. it was an analog paper planner. And some coworkers that I was working with at the time um, took notice and really liked my planner and asked me to make them one as well. Okay. And so I did, and we were all using it, and a couple of them um, earned a free car and directorship within the company that we were working with at the time okay. uh, within six months and they all encouraged me to start my own company and it just kind of flourished from there. Now how did you end up uh, with a partner in this business? What was the process for that? Well that happened um, a a organically I guess. I uh, met Adam <laughs> on E Harmony and he is E Harmony. True story. True story. It's the best way to join a company, Shane, is <laughs> to marry into it. It really is, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, while developing uh, my company, I uh, started my relationship with Adam and okay. it grew into something awesome. We got married and and he's great to work with. Lived so happily now, ever after. Yeah, okay. So now we're working together and we're a team and it's awesome. Now, Adam, you are great to work with. She said it. For later. Now, you also have a very interesting background, and yeah. tell us both the background and how it ties into the company. Well, let's see. Um, I went to school here locally in Long Beach State, and okay. uh, aerospace engineering was my major. Okay. And um, let's see how it ties into the company. Well, we like no, to no, think no, that's that not all of your background, you got to go at least one more step. Um, I have been working for the Navy um, out in Hawaii, okay. so. Um, we like to think that numbers can solve anything, and we're really into big data and big metrics. So, um, I like to think that that kind of information can tie to any company. But okay. right. I was sold right away on this, and I think okay. that there's so much potential for a lot of metrics to be able to p be pulled together all the way over here. Patterns of success are important because you can record all that stuff with the metrics and the, okay. and the system that Janae has built. And with with those, people can see just how. Um, how well they're doing. They can gauge themselves okay. against other people. And if, who knows, maybe somebody has a completely new approach to solving certain problems in life. Okay. We'll be able to track that and share that with other people. Say, hey, you know, 90% of the people that are successful with their own goals work out in the morning. Okay. Don't take that to the bank because I don't know that yet, but that's just an example, <laughs> a hypothetical. But those are the kinds of things that we're going to be able to share. Okay, sounds good. Now, um, what, why is this so helpful to people? I mean, what's the benefit for them? Uh, the benefit for them is that they're going to be able to design their own life, essentially. So okay. they're going to be able to create a personal mission statement, and it's kind of like take, being able to create the big picture and work backwards, okay. which is much okay. more effective. Okay. And they're going to be able to manage their personal development and their professional development all in one place. Okay. Now, there's a lot of self-improvement, uh, you know, do-it-yourself, self-help kind of stuff out mm -hmm. there in, in the bookshelves and elsewhere. So what's different about what Focus Opus does from those other competitors? I would say from the other competitors is we, um, we're kind of like an e-learning tool for productivity. Okay. Okay. So you're going to be learning how to be more successful and more productive, but you're also going to be able to do it at the same time versus reading an excellent book on productivity or reading an excellent book on success and then having no system or no, no place to implement that, which can be very frustrating for most people, which is why most people don't implement the things they learn from a book, no matter how amazing it is. 
Now, what do you two see as coming next in this? I mean, you're sort of, well, I guess maybe start with what stage are you in now, and then what do you see coming next? Well, right now we're in beta, okay. and we're really excited about that. We have a lot of awesome users that are okay. uh, testing our product, and next we're going to be um, redesigning the product, adding a couple new awesome features, okay. Okay. and getting ready to officially launch. Okay, okay. Now, what uh, what do you see coming maybe a year from now? I mean, uh, do you have a picture of what that looks like? I mean, you guys are world in this domination. World domination. <laughs> <laughs> he remembered. <laughs> That's right. Got the easy questions. <laughs> oh dear, this is hard. Uh, so, um, what I'm curious about though is uh, if somebody uses your system. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think they would experience as the primary benefits? What would what would they feel from their perspective is, oh wow, this is different, this is better? Um, well, uh, one of the common themes from our analog system that had a lot of success that uh, our uh, users commented on was that everything that they loved and was most important to them was all in one place. Okay, okay. And that, um, really was important to them because they were able to focus on what mattered to them most and that okay. helped to propel them and make them more productive. Okay. That was actually another thing that turned me on to the whole thing was that um, one of the main you know, columns of, of this whole system is that people actually um, schedule their own free time. People schedule okay. the things that they love to do, which I have been using schedules my whole life and man, they suck. You open it up and it's just a bunch of stuff you don't want to do. <laughs> Screw that, man. I don't want any of that. Yeah. So, um, that's actually a really big plus for this whole thing is that people get to open it up and it's all good stuff and goals and things that they've accomplished. So a year from now, we might be able to track just how much you've accomplished and be able to show you like, you know what, this year you did a lot more than you remember that you did. Look at all this stuff that you were able to accomplish this year. And they can go back and be like, oh yeah, you know, I wasn't that unproductive this year. It was better than I thought. Okay. So now you both have in some way, shape or form used this system yourselves. I mean, you obviously use it in depth you've been using a variation on the theme. Mm -hmm. So having gone through it, what's your advice to people that might be about to access the system for the first time? Any particular advice you give to our audience? Um, one of the things that I would uh, recommend is to, um, and I don't, I don't know if, if, a, if a lot of people recommend this, but to be flexible with your system. Mm -hmm. okay. it, any good plan um, is going to any obstacles are going to rise, you're going to have changes. And to just be comfortable with that and aware of that and feel okay about that, that's something that we like to promote. Okay. So design your plan and allow the flexibility to come in and know that it's going to change. Adam, any other advice for our listeners there? It's all about baby steps. Okay. Uh, if your goal in life, and I use this one all the time, is to climb Mount Everest or you know, canoe the Nile or something, you can't just go out and do it. You got to do baby steps. So you got to train for this, you got to train for yourself for the next step. And, Altitude, you know, you got to get yourself your nice backpack. There's just a bunch of series of baby steps, but before it's all done, you'll notice that I haven't even done my goal yet, and I've already accomplished so much, okay. and not not even hit the finish line. So that's that's been my best okay. biggest takeaway. Sounds good. Now, if people want more information on Focus Opus or you two, how do they contact you? You can go to focusopus.com. So that's www.focusopus.com. Sounds good. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I hope we get to do this again and see where you are in, let's say, 6, 12 months from now. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you very much. You, Appreciate Sean. it. Thank you, Thanks. This has been Eye on Business Innovation. Hi, I'm Adam. And I'm Janae, and we're from Focus Opus, and we want to remind you to have fun and get it done. You mean this right here? Yeah, let's show the audience what we got here. So this is our, uh, the Trash Fairy is our first uh, educational cartoon. And uh, in the cartoon, the Trash Fairy shows an, the average Joe character what yep. his life would look like if he uh, didn't generate any trash. Okay. Welcome back to Ion Business Innovation. We are very proud to be premiering Brett Babos's first animated film, Change Your Trash Habits in Nine Easy Steps. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Steve Van Warmer from Ion Productions. Thank you for watching. My name is Mark Mitchell with TriTech, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hello everybody, I'm Dave Burkus again for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Each week or each time I tell two or three stories that give you a moral, an opportunity to see somebody else, an entrepreneur that has either failed miserably or succeeded wildly, and sometimes you get insights to take home for you from some of these things that we tell. So we'll tell real stories about real entrepreneurs. So I've got three of them for you this week if I can do them fast enough. The first one, unfortunately, is about myself. So I had a company that produced computer systems for hotels. In fact, it was the largest computer system provider for hotels in the United States at the time. And we produced about 22% of all of the automated hotels in the United States, 16% of all the automated hotels in the world at the time when I finally sold the company. But on the way up, we went from 2 million to 4 million to 8 million to 12 million in sales year by year to a point where the company outgrew itself. And this is where the story gets a little bit turned. Because as the company grew faster and faster, you might imagine that support in a hotel or for a hotel has to be 24 hours. And you can't wait even a minute to answer the telephone because the person on the other end can be sitting, standing at a front desk with people waiting to check into the hotel. So our problem was, as we grew, we didn't hire enough trained people for the support staff. Now, can you imagine that every salesperson from every competitor anywhere on earth would have found that out instantly and begun to use those examples against us? Well, they did. 
And so as we grew and got that reputation of not being able to support our own systems, we had to do something about it and did. And it took us about six months to hire, train, and in the end, turn out better quality than we had before. And yet, I've got to ask you a question. How long do you think, with all of that noise being made by those competitive salespeople, it took for the customers, to, or the ultimate customers, the prospects, to begin to realize that we had solved the problem that we created for ourselves? And the answer is two years. And so there really is a really strong moral in that kind of a story, and one that I had to learn the hard way. And that moral is, it is important to deliver first quality every single time. Because if not, everybody who wants to do you in is going to remember that and do something about it. So first quality every time you can. The second story is about a friend of mine. Her name is Kim Shepard. And Kim has a company called Decision Toolbox. It's a recruiting firm, a very unusual recruiting firm because it has 100 employees, not one of whom works from an office. Every one of the 100 employees works from home. So you might ask, how does a company organize itself to be able to manage 100 employees, none of whom are at the office, including executives, and still be able to put the output that it would have to to be able to make money and do well? A virtual company is a difficult company to manage. Kim has done a very good job. And what she's done is divide her employees into groups of five and have them report to each other once an hour. And they do it over Skype or they do it by texting or any other method that they choose among the group. And they end up having mutual ability to see who's working and who's working well. And then for the sales staff, she just lets them grade themselves because the commissions determine who's able to survive over time. And so Kim has created a virtual company with that 100 employees. And the lesson in that one is you can create a company virtually if you're willing to give up a little control and find some creative ways to make it happen. It has saved so much money over time that Kim can brag that she has a company that probably has lower overhead than virtually any of the other recruiting companies that have that many employees, at least, on Earth. I have time for one more story if I do. And this was one that uh, has a moral to it. I learned this. I'm a director at a university as well as many corporations. I'm a chairman of six companies and on the boards of 10 more. And in these board meetings, I've learned something really important. And the first thing that I learned happened to be because I went to a meeting of the company employees run by the CEO and sat quietly over in the corner. And it was a very quiet meeting. The employees weren't talking back, weren't raising their hands, and the CEO was kind of looking at me as if I had done something wrong. And so the day after the meeting, the CEO called me. And he said, Dave, you know, I know you're chairman. I know you're one of the co-founders of this company. But the fact that you're sitting in in these employee meetings is dampening their spirit. And they're not talking like they do to me when I'm in the meeting and you're not there. So I'm going to ask you respectively, Dave. You are the chairman, but please don't come to the company meetings. Wow. You know, the end result of that one is I learned that there are times when you really have to be somewhere and times when you don't want to be somewhere. And there's another lesson that comes from this, too. You know, if I had spoken up in those meetings and I'd given any kind of an order, and somehow that order was interpreted as one that was to be given around the CEO, one that should have been given to the CEO, there would have been hell to pay because the employees would have known that I was in charge and not the CEO. So the danger there is obviously that any board member needs to remember something that I hope you remember always. Noses in, fingers out. It's a very important lesson for all of us. This is Dave Burkus for Ion Business, The Burkus Report. Three. Welcome to Ion Business Innovation. Tonight we are talking with Eric Tanizaki of Southern California Venture Network. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And what we've been trying to do with our most recent guests is try to find out more about the Southern California entrepreneur ecosystem. What's working, what's not working, and what can we do different? So, Eric, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure having you here. Thanks for having me on. Maybe to start with, you can tell us just a little bit about SCVN for our audience. Uh, it's a business networking group, uh, primarily here in Orange County, but more broadly, Southern California. Uh, it was originally founded back in the internet heyday in, in a different format, re really focused on uh, the, the venture uh, VC world back then. Okay. A lot of fast okay. pitches in front of you know, a panel of VC kind of things. Uh, Airnet heyday kind of came and went and it got shut yeah. down, but 
uh, one of my good USC friends uh, out of Marshall School of Business had dusted the brand off you know, about six years ago and recruited me to you know, help them kind of retool the model. And we've really framed it now as a business networking group. So uh, really focusing on a lot of the companies or companies in our network of you know, contacts and friends and the one at 20 mil revenue generating space, J just above where a lot of the very early stage companies are that are you know, purely seeking money right, and funding. Right. But after you, you know, get up and operable, there's a, there's a lot of um, important contacts and introductions and just advice that are needed along the way to really grow. And you know, that, that's a lot of where the strength of our network is able to help companies. How would a company find out about SCBN and join and, and then make use of the, of the help that you offer? Uh, we're at uh, scvn.org. Um, there's some information there and contacting you know, one of us through there, that, that's certainly a way to start and okay. come on out and just start. You know, we, we have a lot of events, mainly private events, but we have some open ones, different topics, okay. that sort of thing. Now, how did you get involved with this in the first place? I, like I said, what, one of my friends was originally had run the group, and uh, but basically I said, "Hey, Steve, I, I want to get involved in this iteration," and okay. he was like, "Great, Eric, you could run it. <laughs> <laughs> Knock yourself out." <laughs> All right. Now you have a particular set of skills your own self that you offer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I'm a partner of an intellectual property law firm, so, okay. so I'm okay. a, a patent attorney, more broadly intellectual property, so okay. patents, trademarks, copyrights. Uh, software, um, domain names, so all the all of that, which are you know r really um, affecting a lot of the innovative companies, okay. you know, okay. around my wheelhouse. So, what else besides the legal side do uh, do your members seem to need most? What What's your opinion about that? Uh, well, every company at that stage needs money, <laughs> but but uh, you know, aside from that, you know, there, there's so many uh, efficiencies that they need. You know, it, it could range from you know getting insurance, you know, okay. like okay. our good friend Dave does, or okay. things like you know, advice on employment, you know, uh, benefits. Um, to, uh, Structuring, you know, the the right contacts, say for accountants. You know, okay. you, you get a, a one mil revenue generating company. It may not make sense to have them working with a, a top four accounting firm, for example. So size appropriate contacts, not only skill set, but size appropriate, because you know certain size companies could only afford you know certain fees and that sort of things, and then just industry contacts. So you know, you know, knowing someone who's a friend of a friend that as a director at you know this company or that company yep. you know and you know you, you put your contacts together and a few people in a room you know quite quickly you can make a few introductions that you know are able to help people out and collectively if everyone's doing that in the room you know the boat rises so that's kind of the, the mindset okay all right well now you've been doing this for a while and so what i'd like to get your opinion on is what do you think needs to be done better, different to help Southern California companies? What could we be doing, whether, whether it's the entrepreneurs or <laughs> groups like SCBN or any, any other organization? Uh, I mean, I, I'm very network-minded, and, okay. and just getting out of the mindset of, you know, there, there's working on the product, working on right. the tech, and, and it's easy to have the head down, yep, you know, yep. grinding, but you know the other side of it that the entrepreneurs you know learn along the way is you know that there's a lot of outward facing there's a, a yeah, lot yeah. of a lot of help and advice that is needed along the way and, and the only way you get there is you know you just got to get out yeah, you know yeah. and you know th there's a ton of organizations groups meetings events that sort of thing but just getting out and being selective who you yeah. follow up with and spend your time with i mean you, you could go to some event meet 20 people, but, you know, if you end up getting pinned down for 20, you know, lunches, you know, you, you, you know and coffee appointments, <laughs> you never do any work. So, so you know, it, it, it's being able to assess people quickly okay. and then, you know, following up and taking that time to follow up with, with people, but um, doing it selectively, doing okay. it smart. 
And that sounds like what the entrepreneurs can be doing. Is there anything we as the providers of the help and so forth, anything we should be doing different? The s same thing. I, I mean, okay. uh, I, I, I'm an attorney. I meet a ton of people. I, I, I could line up appointments with people all day long. Yeah, you know, and I'm not talking about you know the end clients, but say just you know me meeting different service providers and things. But I could spin my gears, and you know, so it's being smart and judicious with your time. <laughs> well, now you've given us already uh, several different tips that uh, people could follow in our audience. But is there anything else? Any other? coaching tip or mentoring tip you'd like to offer our, our audience at this point? For entrepreneurs? Um, Anything you think <laughs> needs to be mentioned or? Well, I, I mean, I, I have my biased view coming from the, as an IP attorney. Okay, okay. Uh, but, That's fair. you know, a you know, couple of tidbits there that, you know, I always see is, you know, it, it's easy to view intellectual property yeah. or maybe not so easy to view, but it, it's kind of like, there's these things I should take care of as an entrepreneur. There's patents, or I've heard about copyrights. Where viewing those things as potentially corporate assets is okay. another way okay. to right. to view things. You know, hey, you know, the, um, in addition to you know, the, not only the traditional okay. reasons, you know, the, these are barriers for uh, my competition and you know, enforcement that that sort of thing. But you're creating value. Okay. You know? okay. Well, we really appreciate you coming on the show and hope you'll be kind enough to come back and give us some Absolutely. updates. Absolutely. Great. Appreciate it very much, Eric. Thanks. Thank you. This has been Ion Business Innovation.